Jack Kirby is one of my favorite comic book artists. And though there were several generations between his most celebrated works and the start of my interest in reading and drawing, I was lucky enough to become curious about his work at a young age. A lot of that was through the work of the artists he influenced, like Walt Simonson or Mike Mignola or even John Byrne, who I became fans of as a kid. But it was probably the reprints of old comic storylines in Marvel Saga that intrigued me the most. In those early issues, his work dominated the pages. Because of course it did. It was his pencil that had charted most of the course for Marvel's line back then. But for all its impact, I can't say I was in love with his work at first. I mean, it's lumpy and ugly and in your face in a lot of ways that you either go for or you run away from. In fact, I clearly remember drawing over his work in ink, attempting to correct it, which I'm sure confirms everything you ever thought about me and the size of my ego. With time, I grew to appreciate his work, and I like to believe that the surgery I did to his comics passed some of his DNA into my own work. But even a big Kirby fan like me has rigid opinions about what the king does and doesn't do well. In my mind's eye, I have a clear vision of who I think he is, what he does, and why. I think of him for bombast, not subtlety. Energy, not nuance. Tons of heart and far less craft. And the drawing and the writing and the storytelling he does on the page. I'm not saying the subtler aspects of Kirby's work were invisible to me. When Orion or the Thing would hold their head in their hands and wonder aloud if they were ever going to be anything more than wrecking balls or punching bags, the existential angst was palpable, clearly drawn from life. Now, you say that you wanted to get out of there, but uh, certainly in <clears throat> a lot of your books that came later on, the Newsboy Legion and Boy Commandos, yes. you use those kinds of characters, those rough street kind of characters a lot. Well, uh, you're good. bound to, because uh, I imagine they become part of what you know, what you grow up with, uh, what life hands to you, and you react that way. And I'm glad in a way, because later on in life, uh, I had to use that kind of an attitude and, uh, in ways that probably saved my life. Was it a rough neighborhood? It was a rough neighborhood. And uh, the practice used to be that uh, you would stand out in the gutter while the trucks would try to get around you from both sides and uh, you'd look for somebody to fight or somebody to chase <laughs> and uh, see how you could stand up against two guys or three guys and uh, how many of your friends you could find that would help out. And of course, that was a routine. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to do it when we came out of school and uh, I, I had a brother, he's passed away now, and he was five years younger than I was. But he was 6'1 and a big, heavy young fellow. And uh, I come out of school and uh, there was his large leg sticking out from under a pile of guys. <laughs> and I, I'd, have to, I'd have to pull him out. And, <laughs> and the, develop, the, the situation would develop along those lines. Kirby's end result was a feeling, an impact that was meant to transport you somewhere larger than life. And because he was quite often very successful, we tend to think of how he achieved this as being something natural. In much the same way we look at an athlete dunking a basketball or hitting a home run on a big stage, we miss those invisible chess moves made on the journey prior to that moment. So that's why this page from Tales of Suspense number 85 where Captain America speaks the language of the kissing fist to Batroc the Leaper's mustache, throws me for a loop. Not because it's the best page he ever drew, but because it kind of breaks down some of the preconceived notions I had about Jack Kirby, and maybe sheds some light on just how oddly savantish or purposefully genius he was when it came to conveying a sense of feeling on a page. To someone as obsessed with comic staging and page flow as I am, this scene is a good reminder of how motion in a comic doesn't have to always make perfect sense in terms of continuity or choreography. At first read, I think you soak this up as an unbroken fight, one move countering another. But if these panels were keyframes in animation, they'd likely be nearly impossible to animate between smoothly. 
And where they frames in a film, you'd be time jumping and cutting like mad as they reposition and teleport themselves from one move to the next. Sure, you do that in all comics to some extent, as the job is picking the best, most impactful moments. But here it's striking what he makes work with so little variation in the figure size, or angles, or height of the camera. Things the old how to draw comics the Marvel way literally tells you never to do. Let's see camera angles the way any ordinary comic book company might do it, compared with the Marvel style. These panels are drawn okay. They tell the story, the characters are recognizable, but they're lacking in raw drama and sheer excitement. That's because most of the layouts are too vertical, too straight up and down, and the heroes are too stiff. They lack the power that Marvel Comics has. Now, without any comments from us, see if you can tell why the second version of the next examples are infinitely better than the first. Infinitely? I don't know about all that, but I'll be diplomatic and say that Stan's probably right in the sense that the second page likely better fits the tone of Marvel's style of comics at the time. A style built from and based on Jack's visual language to a great degree then turned into something scientific and learnable by the fantastic draftsmen who followed like John Bashima. The brilliance of Bashima's reverse engineering probably explains why that second page feels very Kirby-esque at first glance. But this sample page switches angles and size relationships simply for excitement, action for action's sake, and while it is exciting and action-packed and super well drawn, but much like a lot of the house-style comics following Kirby, it lacks the idiosyncratic choices and instincts that I feel make the Batroc page sing. And that's not to say that Kirby didn't have a system, but within that familiar geometry he would experiment, push his choices so that they were just off model, just slightly different each time. And that's because he was telling us a unique story, not just drawing one. Equally impressive as what Kirby doesn't do here is what he does. A closer look at the compositions and choices in the first tier of panels sheds a little light on some of the ways Kirby uses his understanding of shape and composition to influence how we read this scene. Take the position of Batroc's leg in panel one. If you're entering the page at the top left, a common way to read Batroc's foot is in the raised position ready to strike, which is safe and simple enough. But here's where Kirby's strange genius comes in. That motion line from Batroc's foot to his fist serves like a pendulum. The position you see Batroc's foot in is no longer that important. Whether you read it as moving backwards, hiking back for a kick, or already swinging forward in the act of one, the key is you understand it's in motion, a motion that leads us to panel two. From there, we might assume it's simply a matter of following the motion the action lines and compositions convey, but in panel three, something interesting happens. This time, shape takes precedence. One way to read the motion of Cap's swing is up, left to right in an uppercut. Another is the shape of the motion lines that leads us in a left to right downward loop. Either way, another pendulum is created and we're motioned back to our left, reminding us to go down to the tier of panels below. He somehow rhythmically guides you from one panel to the next by the use of shape and line. Big graphic shapes are weighted in the compositions to imply power, big square fists and feet, sharp angled joints and straight torqued axe handle arms and legs. Speed lines shaped in half circles mimic and bounce off the ellipses of Cap's shield, taking us left to right and up and down. Bursts of lines imply impact, working in tandem with an absence of shape to literally blast drawing and detail out on contact. A lack of text and balloons except for Stan Lee who has to be totally f***ing with us or Jack when he says he's going to be quiet, contributes to that unbroken energy. Sidebar on Stan Lee's narration here, it's almost like he's a sports commentator. That lends to this feeling like a fight. Whether that was his intention or just Stan having to be Stan, I'll leave up to you. Anyway, I didn't intend to write any of this. I just got wrapped up in trying to figure out how the hell it works at all. I mean, come on, who the f draws that punch from the America's ass angle in panel 7. Much less makes it feel more powerful than 90% of the modern comics on stands. Jacob ain't got time to bleed Kurtzberg. That's who.